Micromegas. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Micromegas by Voltaire. Chapter 1 A Voyage to the Planet Saturn by a Native of Sirius. In one of the planets that revolve round the star known by the name of Sirius was a certain young gentleman of promising parts, whom I had the honour to be acquainted with in his last voyage to this our little ant hill. His name was Micromegas, an appellation suited to all great men, and his stature amounted to eight leagues in height, that is, twenty-four thousand geometrical paces of five feet each. Some of your mathematicians, a set of people always useful to the public, will perhaps instantly seize the pen and calculate that Mr. Micromegas, inhabitant of the country of Sirius, being from head to foot four and twenty thousand paces in length, making one hundred and twenty thousand royal feet, that we, denizens of this earth, being at a medium little more than five feet high, and our globe nine thousand leagues in circumference, these things being premised, they will then conclude that the periphery of the globe which produced him must be exactly one and twenty millions six hundred thousand times greater than of this our tiny ball. Nothing in nature is more simple and common. The dominions of some sovereigns of Germany or Italy, which may be compassed in half an hour, when compared with the Ottoman, Russian or Chinese empires, are no more than faint instances of the prodigious difference that nature has made in the scale of beings. The stature of His Excellency, being of these extraordinary dimensions, all our artists will agree that the measure around his body might amount to 50,000 royal feet, a very agreeable and just proportion. His nose being equal in length to one-third of his face, and his jolly countenance engrossing one-seventh part of his height, it must be owned that the nose of the same Syrian was six thousand three hundred and thirty-three royal feet to a hair, which was to be demonstrated. With regard to his understanding, it is one of the best cultivated I have known. He is perfectly well acquainted with abundance of things, some of which are of his own invention, for when his age did not exceed two hundred and fifty years, he studied, according to the custom of the country, at the most celebrated university of the whole planet, and by the force of his genius discovered upwards of fifty propositions of Euclid, having the advantage by more than eighteen of Blaise Pascal, who, as we are told by his own sister, demonstrated two and thirty for his amusement, and then left off, choosing rather to be an indifferent philosopher than a great mathematician. About the four hundred and fiftieth year of his age, or latter end of his childhood, he dissected a great number of small insects, not more than one hundred feet in diameter, which are not perceivable by ordinary microscopes, on which he composed a very curious treatise, which involved him in some trouble. The Mufti of the nation, though very old and very ignorant, made shift to discover in his book certain lemmas that were suspicious, unseemly, rash, heretic and unsound, and prosecuted him with great animosity, for the subject of the author's inquiry was whether, in the world of Sirius, there was any difference between the substantial forms of a flea and a snail. Micromegas defended his philosophy with such spirit as made all the female sex as proselytes, and the process lasted two hundred and twenty years, at the end of which time, in consequence of the Mufti's interest, the book was condemned by judges who had never read it, and the author expelled from court for the term of eight hundred years. Not much affected at his banishment from a court that teemed with nothing but turmoils and trifles. He made a very humorous song upon the Mufti, who gave himself no trouble about the matter, and set out on his travels from planet to planet in order, as the saying is, to improve his mind and finish his education. Those who never travel but in a post-chaise or Berlin will doubtless be astonished at the equipages used above, for we that strut upon this little molehill are at a loss to conceive anything 
that surpasses our own customs. But our traveller was a wonderful adept in the laws of gravitation, together with the whole force of attraction and repulsion, and made such seasonable use of his knowledge that sometimes, by the help of a sunbeam, and sometimes by the convenience of a comet, he and his retinue glided from sphere to sphere as the bird hops from one bough to another. He, in a very little time, posted through the Milky Way, and, I am obliged to own, he saw not a twinkle of those stars supposed to adorn that fair inferion which the illustrious Dr. Durham brags to have observed through his telescope. Not that I pretend to say the doctor was mistaken, God forbid, but Micromegus was upon the spot an exceeding good observer, and I have no mind to contradict any man. Be that as it may, after many windings and turnings, he arrived at the planet Saturn, and, accustomed as he was to the sight of novelties, he could not for his life repress a supercilious and conceited smile, which often escapes the wisest philosopher when he perceived the smallness of that globe, and the diminutive size of its inhabitants. For really, Saturn is but about nine hundred times larger than this our Earth, and the people of that country mere dwarfs, about a thousand fathoms high. In short, he at first derided those poor pygmies, just as an Indian fiddler laughs at the music of Lully at his first arrival in Paris. But as the Syrian was a person of good sense, he soon perceived that a thinking being may not be altogether ridiculous, even though he is not quite six thousand feet high, and therefore he became familiar with them after they had ceased to wonder at his extraordinary appearance. In particular, he contracted an intimate friendship with the secretary of the Academy of Saturn, a man of good understanding, who, though in truth he had invented nothing of his own, gave a very good account of the inventions of others, and enjoyed in peace the reputation of a little poet and great calculator. And here, for the edification of the reader, I will repeat a very singular conversation that one day passed between Mr. Secretary and Micromegas. Chapter 2 the conversation between Micromegas and the inhabitant of Saturn. His Excellency, having laid himself down, and the secretary approached his nose. It must be confessed, said Micromegas, that nature is full of variety. Yes, replied the Saturnian. Nature is like a patar, whose flowers... Pshaw, cried the other, a truce with your pataras. It is, resumed the secretary, like an assembly of fair and brown women whose dresses... What a plague have I to do with your brunettes, said our traveller. Then it is like a gallery of pictures, the strokes of which... Not at all, answered Micromegas. I'll tell you once and for all, nature is like nature, and comparisons are odious. Well, to please you, said the secretary, I won't be pleased, replied the Syrian. I want to be instructed. Begin, therefore, without further preamble, and tell me the how many senses the people of this world enjoy? We have seventy and two, said the academician. But we are daily complaining of the small number, as our imagination transcends our wants. For, with the seventy-two senses, our five moons and rings, we find ourselves very much restricted, and notwithstanding our curiosity, and the no small number of those passions that result from these few senses, we still have time enough to be tired of idleness. I sincerely believe what you say, cried Micromegas, for though we Syrians have near a thousand different senses, there still remains a certain vague desire, an unaccountable inquietude, incessantly admonishing us of our own unimportance, and giving us to understand that there are other beings who are very much our superiors in point of perfection. I have travelled a little, and seen mortals both above and below myself in the scale of being. But I have met with none who had not more desire than necessity, and more want than gratification. Perhaps I shall one day arrive in some country where naught is wanting, but hitherto I have had no certain information of such a happy land. The Saturnian and his guest exhausted themselves in conjectures upon this subject, and after abundance of argumentation, equally ingenious and uncertain, were fain to return, to matter of fact. To what age do you commonly live? said the Syrian. Lackaday, a mere trifle, replied the little gentleman. 
It is the very same case with us, resumed the other. The shortness of life is our daily complaint, so that this must be a universal law in nature. Alas, cried the Saturnian, few, very few on this globe outlive five hundred great revolutions of the sun. These, according to our way of reckoning, amount to about fifteen thousand years. So you see, we in a manner begin to die the very moment we are born. Our existence is no more than a point, our duration an instant, and our globe an atom. Scarce do we begin to learn a little when death intervenes before we can profit by experience. For my own part, I am deterred from laying schemes when I consider myself as a single drop in the midst of an immense ocean. I am particularly ashamed in your presence of the ridiculous figure I make among my fellow creatures. To this declaration, Micromegas replied, If you were not a philosopher, I should be afraid of mortifying your pride by telling you that the term of our lives is seven hundred times longer than the length of your existence. But you are very sensible that when the texture of the body is resolved, in order to reanimate nature in another form, which is the consequence of what we call death, when that moment of change arrives, there is not the least difference betwixt having lived a whole eternity or a single day. I have been in some countries where the people live a thousand times longer than with us, and yet they murmured at the shortness of their time. But one will find everywhere some few persons of good sense, who know how to make the best of their portion and thank the author of nature for his bounty. There is a profusion of variety scattered through the universe, and yet there is an admirable vein of uniformity that runs through the whole. For example, all thinking beings are different among themselves, though at bottom they resemble one another in the powers and passions of the soul. Matter, though interminable, have different properties in every sphere. How many principal attributes do you reckon in the matter of this world? If you mean those properties, said the Saturnian, without which we believe this our globe could not subsist, we reckon in all three hundred, such as extent, impenetrability, motion, gravitation, divisibility, etc. That small number, replied the traveller, probably answers the views of the Creator on this your narrow sphere. I adore his wisdom in all his works. I see infinite variety, but everywhere proportion. Your globe is small, so are the inhabitants. You have very few sensations, because your matter is endued with few properties. These are the works of unerring providence. Of what colour does your sun appear when accurately examined? Of a yellowish white, answered the Saturnian, and in separating one of his rays, we find it contains seven colours. Our sun, said the Syrian, is of a reddish hue, and we have no less than thirty-nine original colours. Among all the suns I have seen, there is no sort of resemblance, and in the sphere of yours there is not one face like another. After diverse questions of this nature, he asked how many substances, essentially different, they counted in the world of Saturn, and understood that they numbered but thirty, such as God, space, matter, beings endowed with sense and extension, beings that have extension, sense and reflection, thinking beings who have no extension, those that are penetrable, those that are impenetrable, and also all others. But this Saturnian philosopher was prodigiously astonished when the Syrian told him they had no less than three hundred and that he himself had discovered three thousand more in the course of his travels. In short, after having communicated to each other what they knew, and even what they did not know, and argued during a complete revolution of the sun, they resolved to set out together on a small philosophical tour. Chapter 3 the voyage of these inhabitants of other worlds. Our two philosophers were just ready to embark for the atmosphere of Saturn with a large provision of mathematical instruments, when the Saturnian's mistress, having got an inkling of their design, came all in tears to make her protest. She was a handsome brunette, though not above six hundred and three score fathoms high, but her agreeable attractions made amends for the smallness of her stature. Ah, cruel man! cried she, after a courtship of fifteen hundred years, when at length I surrendered and became your wife, and scarce have passed two hundred more in thy embraces, to leave me thus, before the honeymoon is over, and go a-rambling with the giant of another world. Go, go, thou art a mere virtuoso, devoid of tenderness and love, 
If thou wert a true Saturnian, thou wouldst be faithful and invariable. Ah, whither art thou going? What is thy design? Our five moons are not so inconstant, nor our ring so changeable as thee. But take this along with thee. Henceforth I never shall love another man. The little gentleman embraced and wept over her, notwithstanding his philosophy, and the lady, after having swooned with great decency, went to console herself with more agreeable company. Meanwhile, our two virtuosi set out, and at one jump leaped upon the ring, which they found pretty flat, according to the ingenious guest of an illustrious inhabitant of this our little earth. From thence they easily slipped from moon to moon, and a comet chancing to pass, they sprang upon it with all their servants and apparatus. Thus carried about one hundred and fifty millions of leagues, they met with the satellites of Jupiter and arrived upon the body of the planet itself, where they continued a whole year, during which they learned some very curious secrets, which would actually be sent to the press, were it not for fear of the gentlemen inquisitors, who have found among them some collieries very hard of digestion. Nevertheless, I have read the manuscript in the library of the illustrious Archbishop of Dash, who, with that generosity and goodness which should ever be commended, has granted me permission to peruse his books. Wherefore, I promise, he shall have a long article in the next edition of Moriere, and I shall not forget the young gentleman, his sons, who gave us such pleasing hopes of seeing perpetuated the race of their illustrious father. But to return to our travellers, when they took leave of Jupiter, they traversed a space of about one hundred millions of leagues, and coasting along the planet Mars, which is well known to be five times smaller than our little Earth, they described two moons subservient to that orb, which have escaped the observation of all our astronomers. I know Father Castell will write, and that pleasantly enough, against the existence of these two moons, but I entirely refer myself to those who reason by analogy. Those worthy philosophers are very sensible that Mars, which is at such a distance from the sun, must be in a very uncomfortable situation without the benefit of a couple of moons. Footnote. This fancy of Voltaire, for it was not a conjecture, was realized in 1877 by Professor Asaph Hall's discovery of this planet's two small satellites. End of footnote. Be that as it may, our gentlemen found the planet so small that they were afraid they should not find room to take a little repose, so that they pursued their journey like two travellers who despise the paltry accommodation of a village and push forward to the next market town. But the Syrian and his companion soon repented of their delicacy, for they journeyed a long time without finding a resting place, till at length they discerned a small speck which was the earth. Coming from Jupiter, they could not but be moved with compassion at the sight of this miserable spot, upon which, however, they resolved to land, lest they should be a second time disappointed. They accordingly moved towards the tail of the comet, where, finding an aurora borealis ready to set sail, they embarked, and arrived on the northern coast of the Baltic on the fifth day of July, new style, in the year 1737. Chapter 4 What Befell Them Upon This Our Globe Having taken some repose, and being desirous of reconnoitring the narrow field in which they were, they traversed it at once, from north to south. Every step of the Syrian and his attendants measured about thirty thousand royal feet, whereas the dwarf of Saturn, whose stature did not exceed a thousand fathoms, followed at a distance, quite out of breath, because for every single stride of his companion he was obliged to make twelve good steps at least. The reader may figure to himself, if we are allowed to make such comparisons, a very little rough spaniel dodging after a captain of the Prussian grenadiers. As those strangers walked at a good pace, they can pass the globe in six and thirty hours. The sun, it is true, or rather the earth, describes the same space in the course of one day. But it must be observed that it is much easier to turn upon an axis than to walk afoot. Behold them, then returned to the spot from whence they had set out, after having discovered that an almost imperceptible sea, which is called the Mediterranean, and the other narrow pond that surrounds this molehill, under the denomination of the Great Ocean, 
in wading through which the dwarf had never wet his mid-leg, while the other scarce moistened his heel. In going and coming through both hemispheres, they did all that lay in their power to discover whether or not the globe was inhabited. They stooped, they lay down, they groped in every corner, but their eyes and hands were not at all proportioned to the small beings that crawl upon this earth, and therefore they could not find the smallest reason to suspect that we and our fellow citizens of this globe had the honour to exist. The dwarf, who sometimes judged too hastily, concluded at once that there were no living creatures upon earth, and his chief reason was that he had seen nobody, but Micromegus, in a polite manner, made him sensible of the unjust conclusion. For, said he, with your diminutive eyes, you cannot see certain stars of the fiftieth magnitude, which I easily perceive, and do you take it for granted that no such stars exist? But I have groped with great care, replied the dwarf. Then your sense of feeling must be bad, said the other. But this globe, said the dwarf, is ill-contrived and so irregular in its form as to be quite ridiculous. The whole together looks like a chaos. Do but observe these little rivulets. Not one of them runs in a straight line, and these ponds which are neither round, square, nor oval, nor indeed of any regular figure, together with these little sharp pebbles, meaning the mountains, that roughen the whole surface of the globe and have torn all the skin from my feet. Besides, pray take notice of the shape of the whole, how it flattens at the poles, and turns round the sun in an awkward, oblique manner, so that the polar circles cannot possibly be cultivated. Truly, what makes me believe there is no inhabitant on the sphere is a full persuasion that no sensible being would live in such a disagreeable place. What then? said Micromegus. Perhaps the beings that inhabit it come not under that denomination, but to all appearance it was not made for nothing. Everything here seems to you irregular, because you fetch all your comparisons from Jupiter or Saturn. Perhaps this is the very reason of that seeming confusion which you condemn. Have I not told you that in the course of my travels I have always met with variety? The Saturnian replied to all these arguments, and perhaps the dispute would have known no end if Micromegus, in the heat of the contest, had not luckily broken the string of his diamond necklace, so that the jewels fell to the ground. They consisted of pretty small unequal stones, the largest of which weighed four hundred pounds, and the smallest fifty. The dwarf, in helping to pick them up, perceived as they approached his eye that every single diamond was cut in such a manner as to answer the purpose of an excellent microscope. He therefore took up a small one, about one hundred and sixty feet in diameter, and applied it to his eye, while Micromegus chose another of two thousand five hundred feet. Though they were of excellent powers, the observers could perceive nothing by their assistance, so they were altered and adjusted. At length, the inhabitant of Saturn discerned something almost imperceptible moving between two waves in the Baltic. This was no other than a whale, which, in a dexterous manner, he caught with his little finger, and placing it on the nail of his thumb, showed it to the Syrian, who laughed heartily at the excessive smallness peculiar to the inhabitants of this our globe. The Saturnians, by this time convinced that our world was inhabited, began to imagine we had no other animals than whales, and, being a mighty debater, he forthwith set about investigating the origin and motion of this small atom, curious to know whether it was furnished with ideas, judgment, and free will. Micromegus was very much perplexed upon this subject. He examined the animal with the most patient attention, and the result of his inquiry was that he could see no reason to believe a soul was lodged in such a body. The two travellers were actually inclined to think there was no such thing as mind in this our habitation, when, by the help of their microscope, they perceived something as large as a whale floating upon the surface of the sea. It is well known that at this period a flock of philosophers were upon their return from the polar circle, where they had been making observations, for which nobody has hitherto been the wiser. The gazettes record that their vessel ran ashore on the coast of Bothnia, and that they, with great difficulty, saved their lives. But in this world, one can never dive to the bottom of things. For my own part, I will ingeniously recount the transaction, just as it happened, without any addition of my own. And this is no small effort in a modern historian. Chapter 5. 
the travellers capture a vessel. Micromegus stretched out his hand gently towards the place where the object appeared and advanced two fingers, which he instantly pulled back, for fear of being disappointed. Then opening softly and shutting them all at once, he very dexterously seized the ship that had contained those gentlemen and placed it on his nail, avoiding too much pressure, which might have crushed the whole in pieces. This, said the Saturnian dwarf, is a creature very different from the former. Upon which the Syrian, placing the supposed animal in the hollow of his hand, the passengers and crew, who believed themselves thrown by a hurricane upon some rock, began to put themselves in motion. The sailors, having hoisted out some casks of wine, jumped after them into the hand of Micromegus. The mathematicians, having secured their quadrants, sectors, and Lapland servants, went overboard at a different place, and made such a bustle in their descent that the Syrian at length felt his fingers tickled by something that seemed to move. An iron bar chanced to penetrate about a foot deep into his forefinger, and from this prick he concluded that something had issued from the little animal he held in his hand. But at first he suspected nothing more, for the microscope, that scarce rendered a whale and a ship visible, had no effect upon an object so imperceptible as a man. I do not intend to shock the vanity of any person whatsoever, but here I am obliged to request people of importance to consider that, supposing the stature of a man to be about five feet, we mortals make just such a figure upon the earth as an animal the sixty thousandth part of a foot in height would exhibit upon a bowl ten feet in circumference. When you reflect upon a being who could hold this whole earth in the palm of his hand, and is provided with organs proportional to those we possess, you will easily conceive that there must be a great variety of created substances. And pray, what must such beings think of those battles by which a conqueror gains a small village to lose it again in the sequel? I do not at all doubt that if some captain of grenadiers should chance to read this work, he would add two large feet at least to the caps of his company. But I assure him his labour will be in vain, for, do what he will, he and his soldiers will never be other than infinitely diminutive and inconsiderable. What a wonderful address must have been inherent in our Syrian philosopher that enabled him to perceive these atoms of which we have been speaking. When Lewenhock and Hartsoker observed the first rudiments of which we are formed, they did not make such an astonishing discovery. What pleasure, therefore, was the portion of Micromagus in observing the motion of these little machines, in examining all their pranks, and following them in all their operations. With what joy did he put his microscope into his companion's hand, and with what transport did they both at once exclaim, I can see them distinctly. Don't you see them, carrying burdens, lying down and rising up again? So saying, their hands shook with eagerness to see and apprehension to lose such uncommon objects. The Saturnian making a sudden transition from the most cautious distrust to the most excessive credulity, imagined he saw them engaged in their devotions, and cried aloud in astonishment. Nevertheless, he was deceived by appearances, a case too common, whether we do or do not make use of microscopes. Chapter 6. What Happened in Their Intercourse with Men Micromegus, being a much better observer than the dwarf, perceived distinctly that those atoms spoke, and made the remark to his companion, who was so much ashamed of being mistaken in his first suggestion, that he would not believe such a puny species could possibly communicate their ideas. For though he had the gift of tongues, as well as his companion, he could not hear those particles speak, and therefore supposed they had no language. Besides, how should such imperceptible beings have the organs of speech? And what in the name of Jove can they say to one another? In order to speak, they must have something like thought, and if they think, they must surely have something equivalent to a soul. Now, to attribute anything like a soul to such an insect species appears a mere absurdity. But just now, replied the Syrian, you believed they were engaged in devotional exercises, and do you think that this could be done without thinking, without using some sort of language, or at least some way of making themselves understood? Or do you suppose it is more difficult to advance an argument than to engage in physical exercise? For my own part, I look upon all faculties as alike mysterious. 
I will no longer venture to believe or deny, answered the dwarf. In short, I have no opinion at all. Let us endeavour to examine these insects, and we will reason upon them afterward. With all my heart, said Micromegus, who, taking out a pair of scissors which he kept for paring his nails, cut off a paring from his thumbnail, of which he immediately formed a large kind of speaking trumpet, like a vast tunnel, and clapped the pipe to his ear. As the circumference of this machine included the ship and all the crew, the most feeble voice was conveyed along the circular fibres of the nail, so that, thanks to his industry, the philosopher could distinctly hear the buzzing of our insects that were below. In a few hours he distinguished articulate sounds, and at last plainly understood the French language. The dwarf heard the same, though with more difficulty. The astonishment of our travellers increased every instant. They heard a nest of mites talk in a very sensible strain, and that the lucis natura seemed to them inexplicable. You need not doubt but the Syrian and his dwarf glowed with impatience to enter into conversation with such atoms. Micromegus, being afraid that his voice, like thunder, would deafen and confound the mites, without being understood by them, saw the necessity of diminishing the sound. Each, therefore, put into his mouth a sort of small toothpick, the slender end of which reached the vessel. The Syrian, setting the dwarf upon his knees, and the ship and crew upon his nail, held down his head and spoke softly. In fine, having taken these and a great many more precautions, he addressed himself to them in these words, O ye invisible insects, whom the hand of the Creator hath deigned to produce in the abyss of infinite littleness, I give praise to his goodness, in that he hath been pleased to disclose unto me those secrets which seem to be impenetrable. If ever there was such a thing as astonishment, it seized upon the people who heard this address, and who could not conceive from whence it proceeded. The chaplain of the ship repeated exorcisms, the sailors swore, and the philosophers formed a system. But notwithstanding all their systems, they could not divine who the person was that spoke to them. Then the dwarf of Saturn, whose voice was softer than that of Micromegas, gave them briefly to understand what species of beings they had to do with. He related the particulars of their voyage from Saturn, made them acquainted with the rank and quality of Monsieur Micromegus, and, after having pitied their smallness, asked if they had always been in that miserable state so near akin to annihilation, and what their business was upon that globe which seemed to be the property of whales. He also desired to know if they were happy in their situation, if they were inspired with souls, and put a hundred questions of the like nature. A certain mathematician on board, braver than the rest, and shocked to hear his soul called in question, planted his quadrant, and having taken two observations of the centriculator, said, You believe then, Mr. What's your name, that because you measure from head to foot a thousand fathoms, a thousand fathoms, cried the dwarf, good heavens, how should he know the height of my stature? A thousand fathoms, my very dimensions to a hair. What, measured by a mite? This atom, forsooth, is a geometrician, and he knows exactly how tall I am, while I, who can scarce perceive him through a microscope, am utterly ignorant of his extinct. Yes, I have taken your measure, answered the philosopher, and I will now do the same by your tall companion. The proposal was embraced. His Excellency reclined upon his side, for, had he stood upright, his head would have reached too far above the clouds. Our mathematicians planted a tall tree near him, and then by a series of triangles joined together, they discovered that the object of their observation was a strapping youth, exactly 120,000 royal feet in length. In consequence of this calculation, Micromegus uttered these words. I am now more than ever convinced that we ought to judge of nothing by its external magnitude. O oh God, who has bestowed understanding upon such seemingly contemptible substances? Thou canst with equal ease produce that which is infinitely small as that which is incredibly great, and if it be possible that among thy works there are beings still more diminutive than these, they may nevertheless be endued with understanding superior to the intelligence of those stupendous animals I have seen in heaven, a single foot of whom is larger than this whole globe on which I have alighted. One of the philosophers assured him that there were intelligent beings much smaller than men, and recounted not only Virgil's whole fable of the bees, but also described all that swam them 
half discovered and Remuer dissected. In a word, he informed him that there are animals which bear the same proportion to bees that bees bear to man, the same as the Syrian himself compared to those vast beings whom he had mentioned, and those huge animals are to other substances, before whom they would appear like so many particles of dust. Here the conversation became very interesting, and Micromegus proceeded in these words. O ye intelligent atoms, in whom the supreme being hath been pleased to manifest his omniscience and power, without all doubt your joys on this earth must be pure and exquisite, for being unencumbered with matter, and to all appearance little else than soul, you must spend your lives in the delights of pleasure and reflection, which are the true enjoyments of a perfect spirit. True happiness I have nowhere found, but certainly here it dwells. At this all the philosophers shook their heads, and one among them, more candid than his brethren, frankly owned that, excepting a very small number of inhabitants who were very little esteemed by their fellows, all the rest were a parcel of knaves, fools, and miserable wretches. We have matter enough, said he, to do abundance of mischief, if mischief comes from matter, and too much understanding if evil flows from understanding. You must know, for example, that at this very moment, while I am speaking, there are one hundred thousand animals of our own species, covered with hats, slaying an equal number of their fellow creatures, who wear turbans. At least they are either slaying or being slain, and this hath usually been the case all over the earth, from time immemorial. The Syrian, shuddering at this information, begged to know the cause of those horrible quarrels, among such a puny race, and was given to understand that the subject of the dispute was a pitiful molehill called Palestine, no larger than his heel. Not that any one of those millions who cut one another's throats pretends to have the least claim to the smallest particle of that clod. The question is whether it shall belong to a certain person who is known by the name of Sultan, or to another whom, for what reason I know not, they dignify with the appellation of Pope. Neither the one nor the other has seen or will ever see the pitiful corner in question, and probably none of those wretches who so madly destroy each other ever beheld the ruler on whose account they are so mercilessly sacrificed. Ah, miscreants, cried the indignant Syrian, such excess of desperate rage is beyond conception. I have a good mind to take two or three steps and trample the whole nest of such ridiculous assassins under my feet. Don't give yourself the trouble, replied the philosopher. They are industrious enough in procuring their own destruction. At the end of ten years, the hundredth part of those wretches will not survive. For you must know that, though they should not draw a sword in the cause they have espoused, famine, fatigue, and intemperance would sweep almost all of them from the face of the earth. Besides, the punishment should not be inflicted upon them, but upon those sedentary and slothful barbarians who from their palaces give orders for murdering a million of men and then solemnly thank God for their success. Our traveller was moved with compassion for the entire human race, in which he discovered such astonishing contrast. Since you are of the small number of the wise, said he, and in all likelihood do not engage yourselves in the trade of murder for hire, be so good as to tell me your occupation. We anatomize flies, replied the philosopher. We measure lines, we make calculations, we agree upon two or three points which we understand, and dispute upon two or three thousand that are beyond our comprehension. How far, said the Syrian, do you reckon the distance between the great star of the constellation Gemini and that called Canicula? To this question all of them answered with one voice, thirty-two degrees and a half. And what is the distance from thence to the moon? Sixty semi-diameters of the earth. He then thought to puzzle them by asking the weight of the air, but they answered distinctly that common air is about nine hundred times specifically lighter than an equal column of the lightest water, and nineteen hundred times lighter than current gold. The little dwarf of Saturn, astonished at their answers, was now tempted to believe those people sorcerers, who, but a quarter of an hour before, he would not allow were inspired with souls. Well, said Micromegus, since you know so well what is without you, doubtless you are still more perfectly acquainted with that which is within. Tell me, what is the soul, and how do your ideas originate? Here the philosophers spoke together, as before, but each was of a different opinion. 
the eldest quoted Aristotle, another pronounced the name of Descartes, a third mentioned Malebranche, a fourth Leibniz, and a fifth Locke. An old peripatetic, lifting up his voice, exclaimed with an air of confidence, The soul is perfection and reason, having power to be such as it is, as Aristotle expressly declares, page 633 of the Louvre edition. A quotation in Greek which I cannot read. I am not very well versed in Greek, said the giant, nor I either, replied the philosophical might. Why, then, do you quote that same Aristotle in Greek, resumed the Syrian? Because, answered the other, it is but reasonable we should quote what we do not comprehend in a language we do not understand. Here the Cartesian interposing. The soul, said he, is a pure spirit or intelligence, which hath received before birth all the metaphysical ideas, but after that event it is obliged to go to school and learn anew the knowledge which it hath lost. So it is necessary, replied the animal of eight leagues, that thy soul should be learned before birth, in order to be so ignorant when thou hast got a beard upon thy chin. But what dost thou understand by spirit? I have no idea of it, said the philosopher. Indeed, it is supposed to be immaterial. At least they knowest what matter is, resumed the Syrian. Perfectly well, answered the other. For example, that stone is grey, is of a certain figure, has three dimensions, specific weight and divisibility. I want to know, said the giant, what that object is, which according to thy observation hath a grey colour, weight and divisibility. Thou seest a few qualities, but dost thou know the very nature of the thing itself? Not I truly, answered the Cartesian, upon which the Syrian admitted that he also was ignorant in regard to the subject. Then addressing himself to another sage, who stood upon his thumb, he asked, What is the soul, and what are its functions? Nothing at all, replied this disciple of Malebranche. God hath made everything for my convenience. In him I see everything, by him I act. He is the universal agent, and I never meddle in his work. That is being a non-entity indeed, said the Syrian sage. And then turning to a follower of Leibniz, he exclaimed, Hark ye, friend, what is thy opinion of the soul? In my opinion, answered this metaphysician, the soul is the hand that points at the hour, while my body does the office of the clock. Or, if you please, the soul is the clock, and the body is the pointer. Or again, my soul is the mirror of the universe, and my body the frame. All this is clear and uncontrovertible. A little partisan of Locke, who chanced to be present, being asked his opinion on the same subject, said, I do not know by what power I think, but well I know that I should never have thought without the assistance of my senses. That there are immaterial and intelligent substances, I do not at all doubt. But that it is impossible for God to communicate the faculty of thinking to matter, I doubt very much. I revere the eternal power, to which it would ill become me to prescribe bounds. I affirm nothing, and am contented to believe that many more things are possible than are usually thought so. The Syrian smiled at this declaration, and did not look upon the author as the least sagacious of the company. And as for the dwarf of Saturn, he would have embraced this adherent of Locke, had it not been for the extreme disproportion in their respective sizes. But unluckily, there was another animacule in a square cap, who, taking the word from all of his philosophical brethren, affirmed that he knew the whole secret, which was contained in the abridgment of St. Thomas. He surveyed the two celestial strangers from top to toe, and maintained to their faces that their persons, their fashions, their suns, and their stars were created solely for the use of man. At this wild assertion, our two travellers were seized with a fit of uncontrollable laughter, which, according to Homer, is the portion of the immortal gods. Their bellies quivered, their shoulders rose and fell, and during these convulsions the vessel fell from the Syrian's nail into the Saturnian's pocket, where these worthy people searched for it a long time with great diligence. At length, Having found the ship and set everything to rights again, the Syrian resumed the discourse with those diminutive mites and promised to compose for them a choice book of philosophy which would demonstrate the very essence of things. Accordingly, before his departure, he made them a present of the book which was brought to the Academy of Sciences at Paris. But when the old secretary came to open it, he saw nothing but blank paper, upon which... A.A., said he, 
This is just what I suspected. End of Micromagus by Voltaire. Recording by Ross Clement.